so let's say um, I've I've got access to forty thousand nurses in 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 Boston, and and. 20 years ago or 30 years ago, I decided, gee, you know, I think it would be really nice to study this population. I've got the 40,000 nurses. I can go and measure things on them today and I can follow them for 40 years. And as long as I measure lots of things here, I can then decide which of these variables I can associate with some outcome. So let's say I'm interested in breast cancer and I've got the nurses 40 years ago and I've got a report on exactly what they ate. An associational study would be going back into the data or measuring that data again and saying what happened to those people, the, the, the nurses who ate bacon for breakfast? Did bacon, was bacon associated with cancer of the breast? And if I can find the association and the hazard ratio is above one, I will publish a paper saying bacon for breakfast is linked or associated with cancer risk 40 years later. The problem is when the media writes it, they say it caused it. And that's why you have to be so cautious when you read the associational studies. And the scientists themselves are guilty of it. Because in the text they will say, ba eating bacon for breakfast was associated with cancer 40 years later. And then in the conclusion they'll say, this indicates to us we must stop the nurses from eating bacon for breakfast. Now the problem is, the, 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 the nurses who eat bacon for breakfast are different than the nurses who eat cereals. And 40 years ago, we were told to eat cereals. And we were, who believed they were healthy would eat cereals and we'd go and run marathons and we'd do all these other things. So 40 years later, we don't know whether it was the fact that the people ran marathons or ate, ba or ate cereals that explained their health 40 years later. Associational studies are, are a problem because so many variables differ in the population and you can't bring it down to one variable. If you're dealing with a virus or a bacterium, absolutely, you might be able to pick that up in associational studies. But when they've got something as complex as nutrition, you're never going to isolate one variable that can explain, explain an outcome 40 years later. And I call that those studies scaremongering and I'll, I'll talk to them at length. They're scaremongering studies because you can find anything proves causes anything. And that, that's the problem with those studies. Hazard ratio is the frequency of the outcome. Let's say it's, it's breast cancer in the population who did one thing compared to the other population. So it's the number of people who develop the condition in your one group versus the other group. So the higher the ratio, it means more people developed the condition in the population that you that are doing what you think is causing the problem. So let's say cigarette smoking, for example, the hazard ratio, well, let's say because I'm going to tell you it's about 5 to 10 in smokers, that means 10 times as many people who were smoking developed this condition than people who were not smoking. And uh, Professor, just... Uh, uh for completeness sake, who was, who was Austin Bradford Hill? He was a man who in 1937 really started the understanding of epidemiology. So he's the, considered the father of epidemiology. He did a series of lectures and wrote a book in 1937 on which the entire field of the statistics of epidemiology is based. And finally, in respect of that, Professor, if, it is, if uh, you were to present uh, data or information uh, or uh, studies that are epidemiological studies. If the criticism of you is that they are just epidemiological studies and therefore not, uh, not of high uh, evidential value, what would you say? That's correct. Association studies should develop hypotheses that you then go and test. So that's exactly what Bradford Hill was the first person to find evidence for a strong association with cigarette, between cigarette consumption and lung cancer. And I think we'll come to those papers in due course. But they said the, the hazard ratios are so high that causation is probable. But they then have to go and do the study. So they have to take people who are smoking and, to, and get them to stop smoking and do a randomized trial in which you stop people smoking and some people continue and see what the outcome is.
Now, that's still not a perfect study because really you need to force some people to smoke and others not to smoke, but that's unethical. So the next study they did, which was a intervention trial was to take a population who are smoking and see what happens when they stop smoking and then the measure the instance of, of lung cancer in the group who continues to smoke compared to the group who stops. So those are intervention trials and we think intervention trials are the best evidence that you can have because there you isolate one factor and you change one factor. Can epidemiologic, do epidemiological studies, do they provide any uh, do they bring any benefit to the understanding of nutrition? No, indeed, they could identify if there was one single factor causing a particular disease, it's possible you might be able to find them in an associational study. If the, if the, if the effect was so powerful as cigarette smoking is in lung cancer, you might be able to identify it, but you'd still need to do an intervention trial to absolutely confirm that this is the truth. Please proceed. Sure, thank you. So when these two guys went and looked at the, they went and looked at the 22 countries and they looked at all the variables. They didn't just look at fat intake. So they, they then came to the conclusion, the evidence from 22 countries for which data are available indicates that the association between the percentage of fat calories available for consumption in the national diets and mortality from arteriosclerotic, that is, arterial disease due to this process called atherosclerosis and degenerative heart disease as a result of the atherosclerosis is not valid. The association is specific neither for dietary fat nor for heart disease mortality. Clearly this and then they said tenuous association that means that the hazard ratio is too low. Cannot serve as much support for the hypothesis which implicates fat as an etiological factor in arteriosclerotic and degenerative heart disease. And when they wrote that article in 1957, the American Heart Association concluded that Keyes' hypothesis should not be believed, that it should be, in a sense, put on hold and that he needed to go and do more work. By 1961, the heart, American Heart Association came out and said that fat in the diet causes heart disease. In four years, they changed their mind. Why? Because Keyes became the member of the committee that wrote those recommendations. And he was a very powerful influence. There were no new data, however, so that's the history of what happened. Now, the reality is if you want to look for associations between heart disease, the best one is cigarette consumption. And there's cigarette consumption in the United States, and it matches it almost completely. What you find is that cigarette consumption rises after the Second World War, uh, sorry, the First World War, 1914. And that's, that's because the Americans promote cigarette consumption amongst their the soldiers during the war and then it takes off and by 1960 people are starting to think that the cigarettes may be not so good and they might be causing lung cancer I think that concerns with 1950 and you can see the incidence the heart disease falls now looking at this graph you'd think that heart disease had disappeared because just extend it down you'd think it's gone away but but last year in America one million people died of heart disease one third of the male adult deaths were due to heart disease. So the disease is still prevalent, even though it looks like it is disappearing. And I want to make one other point, that cigarettes may impact on, not on the arterial disease itself, but on the probability that the arterial disease will be stable. And I'm going to make that point at great length, that if you have narrowing of the arteries, but it is stable, you're fine, you're healthy. You have a heart attack when the stability is lost and the artery, the plaque, which we call plaque, when it ruptures. And that is a separate process. And I'm going to argue that cigarette smoking acts on the plaque rupture and that that's what was happening here. That heart disease became suddenly very apparent because arterial disease was there, but it, the rupture of the plaques was suddenly activated by cigarette consumption and now because there is less cigarette smoking, there's less plaque rupture, but the arterial disease is still there. And I'm going to make that point very strongly. And the, because the arterial disease is there, it's still why we have such a high rate of heart disease. It's a complex point, but I will make it further. And I'll make it further because most of us think that if we've got narrowing of the arteries, it's going to take years to benefit from it. And the answer is it doesn't. You can intervene in people with heart disease, 
And if you can stabilize the plaque so it's not going to rupture, the mortality r improves dramatically. And one of the best ways to do that is through diet. And I will show you the data for that. So, so again, I just want to make the point that although cigarette consumption looks like it's causing the heart disease and the arterial disease, I don't think that's the case. I think it, cigarette consumption has a specific effect in people who already have, have heart disease. Now, at the time that Keyes came up with this theory, John Yudkin came up with an opposing theory. And he said, actually, if I take all those countries that uh, Keyes has said are having a high fat consumption explaining their heart disease rates, if I actually look at their sugar consumption, I can see the same sort of curve. And he developed the hypothesis that actually sugar was causing heart disease, not fat. And this debate raged for, for five or ten years, and eventually Keyes won and Yadkin was demonized, he lost his funding, and he had to stop research. A real tragedy, and he, instead he wrote this book, Pure White and Deadly, which is an absolute classic and has now realized that he was 40 or 50 years ahead of his time. Now, how did that happen? And the answer was that there was a group of people who were going to protect the sugar industry from any further investigation. And again, I'm not wanting to make any conspiracy theories, but I'm going to show you a video of how clever the sugar industry was to make sure that no one asked any questions about sugar being toxic and, at ri and ri causing heart disease. So this is what Yadkin was fighting in the 1970s. And I will also give you further evidence about where the money came from. In Washington today, a coalition of health and consumer groups asked the Food and Drug Administration to put a limit on the amount of sugar allowed in breakfast cereals. Their petition to the FDI also asked that a health warning similar to the one on cigarettes be required on cereals which exceed the sugar limit. And there was a lot of movement in the early 70s to regulate sugar that was really freaking the sugar industry out. The Food and Drug Administration was looking at the safety of sugar, and the Sugar Association's goal was to make sure that the FDA concluded that sugar was safe. You go after sugar. You know, imagine the uproar if this FDA committee says sugar is, should not be generally recognized as safe that this is a potential toxin. You know, you're going after major industries. So this white paper became uh, something that the sugar industry submitted to this FDA review committee as part of the evidence. Somehow, the chairman of the Scientific Advisory Board for the sugar industry, George Irving, became the chairman of the actual review committee for the FDA who was looking at the science of sugar. Talk about a conflict of interest. And who do you go to for help? So they could go to Yudkin. And now, arguably, they should have gone to Yudkin. And they could have gone to Sheldon Reiser, and arguably they should have gone to Sheldon Reiser, but they didn't. They went to the sugar industry for help. The FDA just went with the consensus of opinion, which unfortunately were the consensus of opinion among people who were not studying the issue. The sugar industry saying, hey, FDA says we're fine. You know, you could imagine them in some fancy court case in, in Manhattan with their expensive lawyers and they get an acquittal. They didn't do it. We're fine. There's all, still all the evidence there implicating sugar, but they got their acquittal. That's all they needed. 
So, so the point of that was to show how industry interposed its own person to head up the committee to decide whether sugar was safe. And as a consequence of that, they now had the clean bill of health for sugar. And so heart disease were never going to be linked to sugar because it had got the clean bill of health. And so Yadkin disappeared and uh, lost his career. And Keyes became the dominant force and the dominant spokesperson for the diet heart hypothesis. And it's really relevant today because people are much more concerned about sugar today. But that's the reality. It takes 50 years for people to understand the truth. And incidentally, the male sp sp person speaking on the, on the video was Gary Tarbs, who wrote the book Good Calories, Bad Calories, which is a very inspiring book on nutrition. And it's the, really one has to read that to understand modern nutrition.